I'd like to invite Hassanein to come to the podium for his 10 minute rebuttal. <coughs> I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Uh, without taking too much time, I will make a formal introduction when I begin my presentation. But uh, due to lack of time to rebut, I will just spend a few moments in, uh, in just sort of listing these issues with regards to what my, uh, my friend Dan has spoken about. It's very similar, as I see, that your arguments that you've brought forth with regards to the non-existence of God, as you have used in all your debates with the, such as, for example, with Fernandez and the other, others that you've debated with. And it seems that uh, you've got all the arguments laid out on your website, too. And it almost seems like a, um, a dogmatic presentation in trying to refute the existence of God. So let's go with, with the basics here. First, you say that you use reason. Uh, absolutely. Reason is a very necessary tool by which mankind needs to ascertain the realities. If one were to remove reason from his tools, then he fails to, uh, to reach its goal. You say there's a billion people who are atheists. Well, I think you've taken it a little bit too far because a Buddhist is not an atheist. He is, an, he is what we call a non-theist. He does not reject the existence of God. He simply defines it differently in a different manner, and we can discuss that later. When you say that uh, the claim of you, you say that you believe in the, your, you claim knowledge and not belief, I fail to understand how a person can come forward and say that there is no God and say that I don't have a belief. Uh, it's a claim of knowledge, you say, but it's not a belief, and I don't understand that difference. Uh, when you say lack of have evidence. It's amazing that in all the debates that has been taking place between atheists, such as people like Bertrand Russell, as you all revere very much the atheists that do, you find that this argument of design is, is so conspicuous, it's staring and glaring in one's nose, yet you simply say, well, this is just to be discarded as just a mere existence of some primordial soup that came into existence out of nothing with nothing, by nothing, through total probabilistic game, uh, which is absolutely impossible, impossible from all standards uh, of logic and reason, as we would say. So the interesting fact is that, yes, reason is a necessary entity, but something that is so prevalent, that is so clear about, about the system of design in the universe, and to reject it and simply say that it has no purpose, no design, no meaning, it just came out of, a, out of nothing, going nowhere, with no meaning, I think that is really, really stretching the, uh, um, the issue way beyond reason. It becomes totally unreasonable, and that's the question. So you ask me, you mentioned, for example, Isaac Newton. You said he was a great scientific mind, but he was wrong because he couldn't answer some of the things. No one denies that a human being, no matter how brilliant a mind is, can have an understanding of everything. That's not possible. There will always be some level of ignorance in the reality by which we live in. The universe is vast. It's not possible for us to understand everything. That does not preclude the fact, therefore, that I have to reject in a maker. When Isaac Newton said what he said, that maybe he was wrong, but he said there is a design, it did not imply that because he, he had, in other words, he knew 80%, 20% was not known, and on that 20%, because he did not know, he used that 20% as proof that God exists. That's not true. What he said is that there is a designer, but there is this much that I don't understand. Whether we fill the gap or we don't fill the gap has no relevance to the fact that the reality exists, that you haven't answered the rest of the question. Just because we don't know something does not imply it is not there. So when for someone say, if, if, if uh, Isaac Newton says something which he makes a wrong scientific judgment, and everybody makes judgments that are wrong in some time, but that does not imply that they therefore abandon their whole system. And I think that's where we're coming from. So when you say something is falsifiable, how do you prove, for example, how, what, what do I expect from you? The very basic question that we're debating this issue is if you and I did not exist, why would we be debating? The question here has got nothing to do with anything further than our existence. We exist. We want to know where did we come from? What is our goal? You mentioned in all your debates, in your arguments, with regards that uh, you know, we, ha we are moral people, we're good people, we do good things, we give charity. I fail to understand why. Honestly, and I'd like if you can give me some explanation on that, why would you do that? 
You came from nothing. You have no goals. You're going nowhere. You have no goals. Why for this transient period of time are you so concerned about even coming forward and telling the world that God doesn't exist? I fail to understand that. Really, I'm, I'm being very, very uh, concise on this matter. But when you say it's falsifiable, falsify my existence. I challenge that. Tell me that I don't exist. Because the minute you discuss your existence and my existence, you and I have to go back and question the integrity where you come from. And that brings me to the next question. I've noticed, for example, that you, you speak about God. We call Allah God. What is Allah? Allah, by, from the Islamic perspective, means the God, the absolute Indivisible God. The Holy Quran says, Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say God is unique, one. Allahu samad. God is independent. Nothing depends, He depends on nothing. Everything depends on Him. Lam yalid. He does not beget, nor is He begotten, nor is He born. So for someone to say that God had a son, or sons, or sonship, as you mentioned, and we agreed on that, that we don't accept that. This absolute God has no frame of reference. Frame of reference implies something that is bound within time, matter, and space. The problem with these arguments is we keep constantly debating on the issue of bringing God to the relative world. The relative world cannot exist without an absolute creator, and that's the argument. You keep arguing on the issue of God in the relative sense. God is not transient. He is the necessary existence. We are the transient existence, meaning that you and I can exist or not exist. There is a there's an equal chance, as one would say, that a person who exists, who is dependent, cannot cause his own existence. It can tip either way. There has to be a higher necessary existence who is the immovable mover, who is not bound in time, matter, and space. So every time you ask questions about matter, is God a mind? Is he thinking? Does he have gray matter? That's, again, a matter of relative discussion. When we say that God is bound in time, how did he know tomorrow? Tomorrow is not a substantive matter to question about God. God has no tomorrow. He knows. His knowledge is infinite in the absolute sense of the word. And absolute cannot be defined, but we understand it indirectly for this relative universe can never exist without an absolute creator. You speak about infin infinitely merciful God. God is infinitely merciful. But you, the problem once again is you take one dimension of God, meaning the justice of God, and then you Envision it in a pinhole mechanism in a relative sense. You compartmentalize his attribute, and that's where the problem comes. And that's typical, not only for yourself, but for even believers, even among Muslims. There are people who say, God is infinitely merciful. That means that everything I can do is okay, because in the end, he's going to forgive me anyway. But there are, from the Islamic perspective, 99 attributes given to God. The attributes are not separate entities of God. You and I as human beings are limited in our perceptions and concepts. We are compartmental creatures. We cannot think simultaneously multiple times in different dimensions at the same time. Thus the limitation is ours. And this infinite God is communicating to us due to our limitation. And our limitation should not imply therefore that we take our limitations and apply it on God. And that's a very clear indication that when I say God is merciful, when Quran says God is merciful and God is uh, just, these simultaneous characteristics cannot be compartmentalized. We must understand them holistically. And the holistic nature that we can understand and which the Quran tells us through revelation is sufficient to indicate that a universe that is so magnificent, that has endowed every creature with his power to exist. And even an atheist, as you know, yourself also, that when you become ill, you go to the hospital and get yourself fixed because life is very precious to you. It's amazing that you came from nowhere, you're going nowhere, yet life is so precious, you make every effort to make sure you live. And that alone is sufficient indication for man to say, what's wrong with you? Haven't you seen this wonderful system created in you? So when you say you're talking about infinite mercy of God, yes, the mercy is infinite. The fact that you and I have this power to even discuss is the mercy of God. The fact that you and I have the power to reject is the mercy of God. The fact that you and I have the power to obey is the mercy of God. That's what we see as infinite mercy. When you say justice and mercy cannot exist together, that's once again, if you put it in a dimension of the relative world, it makes sense. But God is not relative, he's absolute. So thus, this question is, is not possible. Final point here. So when you say about evil, and I'll answer this question, you've asked this question even to all your previous people with regards to children dying, how would you have stopped him? Would you have stopped him? Yes. I'm under a trial. If I could have stopped September 11th, I would have. But God is not under trial, so it is irrelevant for him. Mr. 
Boca for a five minute response to this. Buddhists are lowercase a atheists. They don't overtly, positively reject a god, but they are atheists by the general definition of what it means to be without belief. I know this was a rebuttal, and I'm waiting to hear for your, your positive arguments. So uh, I'm, I might withhold some of my remarks until we hear your positive arguments. But your whole concept of design really illustrates my point about using a gap. The fact that we don't understand at this time all of the uh, nature of the design in the universe uh, does not give you the freedom to just plug that gap with your God. There are many people who feel like the universe is very poorly designed. There are many people who think there's a lot of cruelty and ugliness built into the universe, built into the human genome. There are some horribly designed sloppy things that are done with our system. So uh, to claim that the, the world is gloriously des uh, designed is a, is a burden of proof that you must share because many of us don't see it that way. We see ourselves as surviving in spite of the lack of design. Um, and Isaac Newton explicitly said that these two things that he did not understand were evidence of design. He said that. He, said, he didn't say there was a gap in his understanding. He basically came out and said, this is evidence of choice. He was using the gap as evidence, which is what theists like to do, which is what you like to do. You like to find a gap in our understanding. The question is, what's going to happen someday when that gap closes? What's going to happen when we go, ah, we do now have a complete cosmological picture? When that happens, will you reject your belief in God? I doubt it. I think you're using these arguments more as an excuse to, to pretend to be intellectual. But if these gaps close, of course, you find some other reason. And of course, it's a relative discussion. We all know that the world we live in is relative. I'm not claiming any type of absolutes or even a transcendent, it's all relative. If you think there is some absolute frame of reference uh, in, in a theistic sense, then it's up to you to show that, not just assume that maybe it could happen. You, uh, during your opening statement, I, I assume you will give us evidence for, not just evidence for our ignorance, but evidence for your, um, your claim that there is this all-powerful being, personal being out there. And then you, you, one of your last comments underscored my opening statement quite nicely. Uh, another one of the incoherency arguments of God is that a, a, to be a person means that you have limits, right? I'm not a redhead. I'm not the big, tall, fat guy from Buffalo, New York. I'm, I'm, I am who I am, and we define ourselves by who we are, where we were born. We have limits, right? And our limits are what define us. But a being who has no limits, who is not compartmentalized, as you claim your Allah is, uh, cannot be said then to be a person because there's no way to know what is not him. A person has to be a limited being in some way. So if God is infinite, if he is totally unlimited, then he is not a personal being. He is this infinite blob of nothingness, basically. You're defining him out of existence. To define God, you have to define what he is, not just what he is not. Thank you. We'll now have Hassanein Rajabali to speak for 20 minutes to present arguments for the existence of God. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one who created everything with utmost perfection. There is no imperfection in his creation, and that which we see as imperfection is our own ignorance and not the system in itself. Thus, for someone to say that the universe is imperfect, one has to admit that it is their mind that does not conceive it properly, and the system that the mind does not conceive it properly is part of the perfect design. So for one to reject that would be tantamount to putting the horse in front of the cart. Uh, I mean the cart in front of the horse, excuse me. So the perspective here with regards to the uh, debate that we're having today is does God not exist? 
We put this burden of proof, obviously, on Mr. Dan Barker because it is essential that for us, in order for us to disprove the existence of God, one has to somehow, from the materialist perspective, come with an empirical observation and disprove the existence of God. One can say that, well, since I can't measure God, therefore there is no proof in the existence of God. Well, that is not reality. The fact is that we exist, and there's a higher dimension by which our existence comes from. Stephen Hawking, in his book, a Brief History of Time, mentions that, that that singularity at the point where this so-called Big Bang took place, as we know, we cannot go further than that Planck's wall of 1 times 10 to the minus 43, because all physical laws that we understand cease to exist. What brought about this grand universe? The universe which functions so intrinsically, so interwoven, inter, uh, that even scientists who study black holes out in the universe understand that they have an effect in my existence in this world. This concept of the anthropic universe, the Holy Quran upholds it very clearly. He says, Alam taraw anna Allah sakhara lakum. Does, do you not see that God has made for you subservient this whole universe? Wa sakhara lakum. Ma fi samawati wa ma fi al Whatever is in the heavens and in the earth, it has been made subservient to you. One might say, therefore, is the whole universe just for me? That is not the implication. The implication is that the universe has been created for my benefit also. Whether I'm the central figure or that is not an issue in this discussion today. But the question to say is the existence of God or the non-existence of God. Let's go further. When you say that the non-existence of God, how would you prove the non-existence of God? The fact that you and I exist is the question that you and I need to ask. How did we come? And this is the typical debate that takes it right to the very basics and says, where did we come from? There's a disagreement in all different schools of thought among the atheists themselves and the agnostics as to where did all this start? Is it a, sta a steady state uh, universe where the universe has always been here? Well, that's been disproven by the very founder, of Fred Hoyle. So you find that that's not true. Is the universe expanding and contracting? Do we have an oscillating universe? That does not seem to show proof at all from reason and from empirical evidence that this universe is expanding and contracting with its mass that it, it, it cannot sustain itself. So the obvious question is we know the universe is expanding. We can see that. We, it, that's been observed. When you talk about the Doppler shift and you look at the red, the red shift, you can see that the universe is expanding. There is a constant expansion. This expansion has a direct implication on my existence on this earth. When we talk about the, uh, the issue of design, you know, my friend Dan mentions that I haven't brought enough evidence. It is not my, my um, platform here to have to bring you an abundance of, uh, of arguments. There are plenty, plenty. It's books and vol voluminous. But the interesting irony is we don't even need that for the very existence of myself that functions and allows me to speak and do what I'm doing in this sphere of a grand universe where I have this capacity to produce sound and to breathe and to think simultaneously move and have depth of perception, if you're going to reject that as design, then you're begging the question. Because essentially then it doesn't become that convince me rather than saying, well, I'm, I, I'm not willing to be convinced because I want to shut my eyes and I want to be blind. So when you say that, uh, how can you prove the existence of God? First of all, we exist in this universe. The design and the probabilistic factors make it impossible scientifically and empirically for the universe to come into existence the way it did. In, in, with reference to Planck's wall, you find 1 times 10 to the minus 43. All the basic fundamental laws were set in motion. We talk about natural selection. This argument is constantly brought. Natural selection is an entity that is part of the great design. You seem to have taken this thing and taken a pinhole vision of how the engine in a, in, in a car does a combustion and said, that's it, that's all we need. We don't need to worry about the car itself. It's the combustion within the pistons that take place. It's sufficient for us. Well, okay, even if that is what, what, you, what you take, that in itself is incredible design. So to reject design is once again begging the question. So, uh, you know, in all the arguments I've seen, in all the discussions that I've seen with regards to the debates that take space between the atheists, these issues of design that have been brought forth in numerous, numerous ways, okay, it's so sufficient that due to lack of time here, there's no need for us to bring it forth. But if you need it, we can certainly spend 
10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever you need, and we can discuss all these aspects of design. And for you to refute even a single one of them and take it out of perspective and say it's not needed in this grand holistic universe, then we're begging the question once again. I will just spend very little, uh, uh, just going very quickly in describing our position as Muslims so that at least we are on a better platform so that there's no confusion here. When we talk about Islam, what does Islam say with regards to God? God is absolute. You asked this question just now. You say absolute frame of reference. A frame of reference implies that there is a position by which something is. For example, in science, I cannot say that this room is 500. 500 what? 500 yards, 500 miles, 500 kilo, uh, kilograms. What is it? What do you mean? I need a frame of reference. A human mind cannot function outside the frame of reference. It's impossible. And that's where our limitation lies. The fact that we are so bound within the frame of reference, we are having a problem in these discussions. But God is not bound in the frame of reference. He's the creator of time. Time is a creation of God. Matter is a creation of God. These are transient entities. Transient entities cannot come into existence by themselves. Nothing can, come from ex uh, nothing can exist from nothing with nothing by nothing. That's not possible. That means that our existence had to have pre-existed a, 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 what we call the necessary existence. In Arabic it is known as wajibul wujud. The necessary existence that brings forth all the transient mumkinul wujud into existence. And the, the, the mumkin can never demand its own existence, nor can it demand its own non-existence. It cannot. Okay, so that's very important to understand. So when we talk about frame of reference, we must clearly understand that every time we ask questions about God in time, knowing the future, we have to be very careful in how we're defining this terminology. For God's knowledge of the future, of my future, is absolute in His domain. He knows everything. But he's not bound in the time where he is experimenting himself, for he's not bound in space, time, or matter. Those are created entities which he has put into it. So for me to put him into it would be also very wrong. When you say that uh, uh, infinite blob of nothingness, okay, you've just contradicted yourself. When you say infinite blob of nothingness, that's a contradiction in statement. And I think it's, uh, it's just a matter of rhetoric, and I think that's basically what it says. But let me spend a few moments here to explain with regards to the issue of evil, as you mentioned, and with regards to what is our position from the Islamic perspective. God created this universe out of his infinite mercy. Quran says, Katab ala nafsi rahma He has made incumbent upon himself, it's metaphorical, that mercy is upon his creation. We are all creation. That's why when I began my presentation, I said I begin in the name of God, the merciful, the beneficent. Now one might say, well, what kind of a merciful God is this who brings pain and difficulties and so on? Let me explain very briefly without taking too much time. First and foremost, we have been created to be tried. The Quran clearly states that, that mankind has been created for a trial. This trial is not for God to know, it is for man to know. So in other words, when I'm under trial, though God knows exactly what is going to happen to me, I am under that trial. And it is not for him to know, that he, it is not for him to know what I will do. When it comes to free will, let me explain. A human being has free will. He's been given total authority to choose his own destiny. But God already knows this. And knowledge of God about his free will does not imply the fact that because God knows, he has caused him to do it. Those are two separate entities because in the absolute realm, once again, it's not bound in time and we've got to take that into perspective. Into perspective. We are under a trial. Humankind has been created, has been endowed with intellect. The Quran mentions it beautifully. He said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We have created man in a perfect form. We have created him. He says, what does it mean? He says, the Quran says, uh, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَ This self, the soul that is in me, has been perfected. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَىٰ And it has been taught wrong and right. That means when the common atheist says, I have these morals in me, I know what's wrong and what is right, exactly. The Creator has planted that into your soul. And it is the beginning platform that if a human being says that you never communicated with me on the day of judgment, you say, no, no, that's not correct. It was already implanted in you, and you already knew what that moral goodness was. And when we discuss morality, you will see that this whole concept of free thinking and atheism as it stands, and agnosticism, really, I tell you, in, in, its, in its truest form, it is wiser for an atheist to say he's an agnostic than to come forward and say, 
uh, atheism, and, I, and I'll show that to you. As you mentioned yourself, you say, uh, we, we are not certain about this universe. We don't know. That I fail to understand how you can take a stand and say that there is no God. You yourself admit, you say that there is no design. We don't understand all the dimensions of it. So how come you've taken that step, leap forward, and say there is no God, therefore? You should subject yourself to the same scrutiny and say, I, I don't have all the evidence, therefore I can't make that leap of faith. A man comes to a holy prophet and says to him, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. He says, why? He says, because I, don't, I, I believe that the universe has always existed and will always exist. There is no God. He says, why is that? He says, because I haven't seen a God create. He said, have you seen the universe? Always exist and will always exist? He said, no. He said, how come you have taken one side over the other? It is wiser for you to say, I don't know, and I will subject myself to further scrutiny than to take a stand and say there is none. Just because you've taken that stand, you don't have any evidence. In fact, if you look, it is very bold for someone to say there is no God, considering that you yourself are so bound with this in intrinsic system, which is so magnificent. I mean, I, I think that's the interesting thing, by the way, from the Quranic perspective, and when you read the Holy Quran, you will find there are very few verses with regards to the argument against the atheist. There are very few. In fact, the Quran just asks the question, how can you reject when you were created and you will die and you will be raised again? Do you not see? As my brother Abbas recited Surah Al-Rahman, he said, we created you. Which of my bounties will you belie me for? All these wonderful things we put for you. Which of my bounties? It is so inherent that there is no need to get into semantical arguments, polemical arguments, and then say, well, I need to debate this. But look, look at you. You've negated something that's so obvious. And as you mentioned, you know, in, in your um, presentation before, when you say, you know, if the Christians said, oh, gravity, come down, what comes up, what comes down? Yes, it's absurdity, precisely. That's the point from a believer, a theistic believer, that when you reject this fantastic design, that is absurdity from that perspective. So, uh, in, in retrospect, when we talk, we talk about uh, uh, the whole concept of the Islamic perspective, we are under trial. We've been endowed with intellect, we've been endowed with free will, we've been given the choice to, re to accept and reject our own destiny. This is what the trial is all about. Now let me explain. When a teacher gives an exam, your, your implication is, why is there evil in this world? What is evil? From the Islamic perspective, there is no such thing as absolute evil. There is no such thing. Absolute evil does not exist. It's relative, and it changes its positions depending on which side you take and which angle of perspective you take. That which is wrong for one thing could be very good for another simultaneously. Just the same as in a relative frame of reference, I can say that I'm extremely huge to an atom, and I, at the same time, at the same moment, I'm extremely small with relations to the universe. At the same time, it depends on my frame of reference which things change positions. Thus, when we talk about relativity, which we are existing under, when we talk about good and evil, they take positions inside, but nothing in the universe is absolutely evil. There is no such thing. An absolutely perfect God does not create an imperfect system, nor is there such thing as evil in its absolute sense. I'll give you another example. Lies versus truth. You would find lies, is, in a common sense, is evil. To lie is evil. To speak the truth is good. You'll find lie cannot exist without the truth. Yet truth can exist without the lie. And I'll give you a simple example. If I say that I always lie, does it make sense? No. Because there is no essence of truth in my statement. Thus, it, it becomes nonsensical. Thus, truth is a necessary constituent to lies. Because lies cannot exist without truth. But I can certainly say that I always speak the truth. Or I sometimes speak the truth. It makes perfect sense because there's an element of truth in my statement. And thus, my statement makes sense. So when it comes to the relative perspective within Islamic posi uh, position, that is what it means. That when Allah says, Min sharri ma khalaq, By the evil or by that rejection which he has allowed. What does evil mean from the Islamic perspective? That which lacks good. It's just like darkness does not exist. You cannot measure darkness. It is lack of light that you can measure. You cannot measure coldness. It is lack of heat, because it is only heat that our senses measure, not darkness. Darkness is a reaction to that which exists. So uh, from the perspective of Islam, it's a relativistic position, and evil is a trial. When evil comes into play, would we say that when a teacher gives an exam, and each question has five multiple choices, and each question has five multiple choices, only one is the right answer and four are wrong. From that perspective, you would say one is the good answer because if you, use, if you select that answer, you get rewarded. If you select the other four, it's evil because you get punished by getting a, uh, a, a zero for that question. Now, would you say that the teacher is inherently evil for having put four evil answers to one good answer? 
Or would you say, therefore, that the exam is so preposterous that it absolutely evil absolutely outweighs the good? Would you say that the teacher, therefore, should remove all evil and make all the answers correct? In fact, you would say, you're fooling me. You are now shaking my own foundation that you are, in fact, insulting me. Either give me the exam and allow me the ability to select my own ways and to see the difference between good and bad. Otherwise, don't try me. Because trials, if you look, examinations are an inherent part of our existence. No human being on earth, be it a theist or a non-theist, exists outside the realm of, of an exam. We are being examined today by this debate. Why are we doing this? Because we want to find out that which is right and what is wrong. If the wrong did not exist, would we be able to debate? No. And when you say that we want to discuss this issue, absolutely. Discussion, bringing it forth, bringing the power of reason and having an open mind is very essential. But to condemn unequivocally just because one thing rejects to you, that's a bit, you're pushing it a little too far. I, I like the academic discussion to say, well, there is plenty of evidence here. Let's look at it further. But rather than just say, well, that's it, I don't want it. And the Quran mentions, he says, they reject it because they want it that way. They wish it that way. But the reality dawns upon them. And what the Quran is saying, and from the Islamic perspective, we are under trial. Evil is a relative entity, and it is a trial by which mankind should appreciate the good. When you see a child dying, yes, it is sad. But what if a child could not die? Let's take that perspective. That if you chop a, the head of a child, he's still alive. Put a bullet in a child, it's still alive. It's immune from all diseases. That would be, in fact, a state of, of preposterous. Uh, mentality. You say, what is, what is this? What system is this? That I can abuse a child and kick it like a rubber ball? Because no matter what you do with it, nothing happens to it. Well, if it did happen, oh, see, God is evil. He allowed the baby to die. So you're, it's a cash 22. It's a circular argument. No. The argument is that for you to appreciate a healthy baby, one needs to have a relative perspective by which to understand good. Good can never be understood without, without that which is not good existing simultaneously. We're relative creatures. That's how we understand things. And we can never have a conception of that which is bad until we understand what is good. That reality, that coexistence is a necessity in this world. If one wants to say that evil should not exist, then the earth should not exist. You and I should not exist. A trial should not exist. An exam should not exist. Rather, we are in a system where we understand that evil is there. A lot of the evil that ha takes place on earth is man-made. It is not natural. If you look at natural disasters, such as an earthquake, an earthquake for the greater good is good for the earth. When it releases its heat from the center of the earth, and the fact that it shakes, it makes it it's good for the greater good. So would you say that we should eliminate all earthquakes and let man survive? No. For the Islamic perspective, this trial, this world is transient. It is a short time period. And within this trial, when you die, this is just the beginning of this existence. What follows after? Allah says many, many times in the Quran, He says, we created you from nothing. What is to prevent us from making you again? We can bring you back just like that and take you to, to non-existence just like that. It means nothing to God. It is nothing. He says, you walk pri with pride thinking that you are so intelligent with your scientific observation. Look at a scientist. He's so proud. He's a great thinker. What has a great thinker done? Nothing except observe. Nothing. He has not created he has not invented, he has just observed. When you see Isaac Newton observed gravitational forces, he simply observed and he became a great man. Imagine the one who put the gravity there. No, that's out of design, we say. We, we revere people. So when we talk about this, however we cut it, yes, however we cut it, we have to, we have to examine this. So from the perspective of Islam, evil is something that is under trial. The Quran mentions that, be patient. And understand that your reality, your dogma, your system has a higher good. And your trials and tribulations in this world is part of this exam. In conclusion, you would never say that a teacher is evil when it examines a child. Nor does the teacher give an exam for the teacher to know what the student will do. No. The student goes to university and takes an exam for himself to know how well he is capable so that he can use that in order to get a better salary out in the real world. It is not for the teacher to know. So for one to say that God needs to know, right here is the very simplest example one can give, that in an exam without that which is evil, and it is not part of the system, it cannot be an exam. It is tantamount to removing that entire system. Thank you. Barker, 10 minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you, Hassan. You have a 
a good gift of teaching. You're, and you're a good man. <laughs> he is a good man. I think most religious people are good people. In spite of their holy book, they are good people. And I applaud all the good that Christians, Jews, and Muslims do in the world, Muslims do in the world. But I think your opening statement basically proved my point. And you also are attacking a straw man. I have never said there's no design in the universe. I have never said that I reject design. You must have been reading another debater somewhere. There is ample evidence of design in the universe. And we can account for that design in natural ways. There is design by natural selection. When you look at the ridges of a sand dune, when you look at the design of how molecules combine because of the limited number of ways that geometrically they can come together, that's a certain design by the laws of nature. Yes, there is design. and. Your argument about design basically amounted to what I said it would in my opening statement, a god of the gaps. What you are saying is that, basically, here's your word. Where did we come from? You gave as evidence for God. Where did we come from? That's a question, right? That's not an evidence. That is a question. And then you have, surprisingly, you find this book, this ink on a page that tells you where we came from, and you plug that question with your particular brand of a god. Theists have been doing this for centuries, for millennia. They've been plugging that question with their God. So you have not given us evidence for a God. You've given us evidence for our ignorance. And I claim that there is a lot of design in the universe that can be explained in natural ways. And it is beautiful design. It is wonderful design. And it is right here in our own backyard. It's not some transcendent mystical thing out there. But think about what you're saying. If functional complexity and design. If that requires a designer, right? You see a watch in the ground, oh, a designer or multiple designers made it. And the human mind is complex and look how we, we exist, we function, we feel, we are moral, we have, if all of this design that's within us, how our eyes function, that requires a higher designer than us because we could not have designed ourselves, right? Well, think about this. Is not the mind of Allah beautifully organized? Does it not function with purposes? Does it not have a goal? Does it not have some kind of an inner workings of desires and wants and needs and goals and purposes? Is it, is it not also beautifully designed or is it just some random jumble of transcendent ideas? If, in order for you to worship your God, you have to assume that your God is a purposeful being, that your God has a mind that functions in a logical way somehow. Your, your God makes a decision, affects that decision. It doesn't happen in reverse. There's some logic to it. The mind of your God is, as you say, beautiful, wonderful, organized. By your own reasoning then, if functional complexity requires a designer, then the functional complexity of your designer also requires a designer. God needs a designer himself. Otherwise, your logic is wrong in the first place. You have to, if your God's design does not require a designer, then neither do we. And it is you who is begging the question. Because suppose there is a God up there. God is sitting up wherever, in the seventh heaven or whatever it is, and God is saying, well, here I am. I'm here, and I have desires, and, and I think I'll create some worlds and people, but I exist, and according to you, we should not even question our own existence, right, without having some frame of reference outside of ourselves. What gives your God the freedom then to say, I exist, but I'm not going to question my frame of existence. I just exist. The logical question is why? How? How did this God come into existence? If he does exist, if he is functionally complex, if he is beautiful, and if he acknowledges existence, then you are simply answering one mystery with another mystery. You're not answering the question. You're simply delaying the question. We don't understand our existence, therefore there's a designer up there. But the designer, if he or she asks that same question, comes to the same problem. We atheists prefer to stop with what we don't know. We don't prefer to unnecessarily multiply hypotheses to say, oh, there must be something greater, because it doesn't answer anything. It doesn't, it doesn't give us uh, uh, evidence for. You say uh, in the Quran that we atheists reject it because we want it that way. That is untrue. The Quran is wrong to say that. I do not reject the belief in God because I want it that way. If there is a God, I will accept. 
I will believe. If there's a God, I would be foolish to ignore it. I don't want it that way. It's not a matter of what you want. And in fact, you seem to be betraying that there is a religious bias within people. Because I could say that you believe in God because you want it that way. That doesn't answer anything. That amounts to an ad hominem argument. You're attacking me as a person rather than the evidence by telling me that it's my inner weaknesses or my inner desires of not wanting God. That is unacceptable in a debate to attack your opponent's motives. If there's a God, uh, it doesn't matter if I want it or not. I want the evidence for that God to exist. You say nothing comes from nothing. Well, is God something? God, if God says nothing comes from nothing but he's something, well, then how could he even exist? Think about this. How many ways are there for something to exist? Lots of ways, right? There's lots of ways for universes or something to exist. How many ways are there for nothing to exist? Only one. So which is more likely? That something exists or nothing? Why do we assume that reality, if left unperturbed, would somehow default to this state of nothingness, as if that were a thing? Obviously, something exists. And even if God exists, God is something and something exists. It, Something existing is a brute fact of reality. The whole concept of nothingness is an incoherent concept in and of itself, even as you were pointing out. Somewhere we need to refer to some brute fact. And we atheists say, well, existence exists. It's here as far as we perceive it to exist. God is on trial. God claims to be omni-good. He claims to be all good. If a teacher in a classroom is giving an exam to a student, and a teacher sees one of those students hurting in some way and refuses to help, then that teacher is guilty of some kind of an accessory to the continuation of that student's pain. Now, you admitted you would have stopped 9-11, and so would I, and so would everyone in this room have stopped it, right? So if your God is all good, he is on trial. Do you see the point of the problem of evil? He claims to be all good, and you claim that if you pray to him, he will answer your prayers, but repeatedly your prayers are not answered. He apparently cares more about the free will of Christian and Jewish and Islamic terrorists than he does about the human lives, those precious human lives who could have been saved. And you say it's a test that it could, evil is relative. So in God's mind, 9-11 could have been good. According to your reference, if evil is relative and it's just a uh, lack of good, then in, in God's mind, 9-11 could have been a good thing. You're telling us that there could be some mysterious higher way that something like that could have been justified. And I say that kind of thinking is morally bankrupt. To excuse anybody, your master, your slave master, your lord, your teacher, your god, because he or she is good and has a higher purpose, that is moral bankruptcy. It removes you from the field of criticism. It removes you from the ability to say, I disapprove, I denounce. I will say that if your god or the god of the Bible do exist, and if I am forced to meet him someday, then I will denounce him to his face. I will say you are a brutal god. I do not respect your actions. You caused harm and you could have avoided harm and you did not. As a moral being, I have an obligation to say that to a slave master who bosses me around, a slave master who tells me to bow down. So I think we naturalists have a firmer grasp of what it means to be moral than believers who just simply close their mind and say whatever the Father wants is what, what we get. You use the word judgment in your statement. And the word judgment basically boils down to heaven or hell, right? Again, I will say, heaven and hell. Hell is a threat. Hell is an intimidation. Do we want to burn? The Bible and the Quran are filled with these examples of, I'm going to get a double dose of hell because I'm an unbeliever, right? That's a threat. That is a threat to me. A physical intimidation on my person is what that book is. If I don't follow the way you people think. So I will repeat, any system of thought, any ideology that has to make its point by threatening violence, as the Bible does and as the Quran does, is a morally bankrupt system. We can find a natural way to be good to each other by minimizing harm in the natural world, by being kind to each other, by being good to each other in the natural world in ways that we know lessen harm. We don't need some daddy in the sky to tell us what to do. We all know it. We didn't need the Ten Commandments to tell us there was something wrong with killing. We could have figured it out on our own, and we did long before the Ten Commandments. Thank you.
Hassanein Rajabali for five minutes before we take a short five minute break. Okay, in this five minutes, I'd just like to make some very quick points here. First and foremost, uh, when you say we want it from the Quran, that the atheist wants it, the want and the need is an inherent fact of all creatures. That is not what I say. What I say is the want for a believer to want to have an understanding of his own existence is equivalent to the one who is a non-theist or an atheist who wants to understand his existence too. The want is not in question. It's how we come to the conclusion is what I'm saying, that we want the conclusion. I'm not saying that we have a desire for want. I'm saying we want the conclusion. We are manufacturing the conclusion. In your rebuttal, in the few minutes, it's amazing that you've completely ignored that entire issue of design. You're saying, yes, there is design. Yes, there's wonderful design. But I can say that that is natural selection or that is the natural movement. You know, it's interesting that you're accepting this incredible system, but you don't want to go further than natural selection. Natural selection is part of the greater. It's part, it's part of the greater. And you've, you have limited yourself within a scope of a, of, a, of a greater, and you've said, this is all I'm going to focus on. I'm going to ignore the greater. Natural selection cannot exist by itself. It cannot demand its own existence. It's part of the greater system. You don't want to answer that question. And I notice why, because the minute you do, you're going to have to question the integrity of where you come from. I have absolutely every right, just like every human being does, to find out where did we come from. For you to say that this is the, 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 uh, uh, the idea of gaps, okay, the God of the gaps, as you might say, when you talk about God of the gaps, for you to say that there is no God is also for you a gap. Also a gap, first of all. But I think your gap is much wider for one to say that because it's this incredible design, therefore there's no maker. Therefore there's no designer. But then you turn quickly and say, well, if there is a design and everything has a designer, therefore then the designer needs a designer. But I just told you before, but you didn't apparently understand. In the relative world, there is that transit nature of design systems. But the absolute creator is the is the uh, immovable mover who is not bound in the design. You have not come to the absolute domain and challenged me on that perspective, that this absolute God who is not bound in time, matter, nor space cannot be questioned in this integrity. And you keep questioning in that integrity. You're saying, God, you've written this article, Dear Theologian. I mean, honestly, uh, Dan, with all due respect, you say we're good people. We're good people. We atheists are good people. We're kind people. For what you write... Have you ever taken consideration that there are those who believe in that theological ideology? That you're bashing them so face forwardly, almost in an instigating fact, uh, uh, fashion, that you might say, well, how about me? How come I'm not so academic and say, you know what, this is what they say, and that's perfectly fine, rather than go and make satirical fun of God, that I'm so lonely up here, I know nothing, and if I read that dear theologian for you, and you've written it, but if the, if the public were to read it, really, to me, it's, it's very insulting. And I think an academician like yourself, and I really admire the fact that you come forward and you pose these questions, and I like your, 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 your pattern by which you're saying, I want to understand, and that's wonderful. And I respect you for that, and that's the reason I'm debating you. And the reason is that I think when the arguments come down and the substantive matter comes, like the Quran says, Kul hatu burhanakum in kuntum Tell them to bring the proof if they are real. If they are truthful, bring the proof on the table, put it there. Here he said, nothing comes from nothing. I did not say that. I said, nothing comes from nothing with nothing by nothing. That is what I say. I did not say nothing comes from nothing. I said, nothing comes from nothing with nothing by nothing. So you misquoted me there. You say teacher versus God. You say teacher, God is on trial. Once again, you put God in the relative world, therefore you put him under trial. God is the absolute creator. He is not under trial. He has no deficiency. So for you to say that he needs to go on a trial implies that there's a deficiency. And that's not, a, that's a, that's, that's not acceptable. Uh, you're saying that I don't accept God because he's forcing me to bow. You're a naturalist. It's interesting. You're bound by gravitational forces. You're bound by your gender to be a male. You're bound by the two eyes. Why aren't you angry with that? Why don't you say, I'm a male and I've been forced by natural laws to be a male, to breathe oxygen. I cannot breathe nitrogen. I cannot breathe underwater. Okay? I cannot reverse my time. I cannot reverse my age. I cannot stop my birth. Why aren't you angry with those things? You said, no, I'm a naturalist. I love this thing. And I fail to understand that. 